I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, our favorite fictional podcasters are suspected in another murder at the Arconia. Can Charles, Oliver, and Mabel clear their names and solve the case? We'll discuss season two of Only Murders in the Building. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of the These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband, and yes, the love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of Dead on Deadline, my favorite easily distracted friend, Lara Bricker. Hello, Lara. Hello, Rebecca. And soon, author of The Final Curtain, coming oh. mid-September. So exciting. I'm, I'm very upset, though, that it's not going to be out in time for my beach vacation like it was last time. <laughs> but actually, we'll be out in time for our next vacation that we're going on for my birthday. So okay. I'm going to sure. bring it yeah. on I mean, that trip. You don't need to be distracted from Bridget the Midget on your beach vacation. So <laughs> focus on that and That's my true. book will come out after. And lest you think Laura just said something offensive, she did not. That is actually the name of a person who gave herself that name who works as an adult dancer, an exotic dancer at an adult cl- circuit club. Actually club a circuit. porn star. Yes, whatever. Anyway, she's lovely. I'm sure she's a wonderful person. Did you hurt yourself bending over backwards? I'm uh, just saying. Okay. I just don't want people to think that Laura would typically use that word when it's a word that Bridget uses for herself. No, that's actually what she uses to advertise herself. Correct. And all of the various things she's involved she with. That's member, Bridget the Midget with a capital every M. Every time when Kevin and Rebecca go to their beach vacation and I drive down the back way, there is a sign next to the kitten Gentlemen's Club, replacing the baked ZD 899 sign Correct. with the Bridget the Midget two wants, nights only sign. So, who wants baked ZD at an exotic dancing? Well, this is my club. ongoing question, Kevin, and I, I have yet to get an answer as to who eats that ZD, but um, that sign is often up when I drive to see you guys down at Plum Island. Yes, it is. And, and those of us, of course, who listen to Howard Stern for many years know that Bridget was a member of the WAC Pack from the way back in the old days. And finally, our captain of all things cynical, author of the City Trilogy, host of the Strange Arrivals podcast, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast, Toby Ball. Finally, hello, Toby. It is nice to talk with you. It's nice talking with you too, Rebecca. So, Kevin, this is obviously Monday show. And for the summer, of course, we're only a weekly podcast. What is coming out on next week's show? On next Monday, we're going to be talking about the HBO original documentary series, Mind Over Murder. All right. That's a pretty intense one. I'm looking forward to talking about that with you guys. It's about murders and mimes. Yes, it's about a mime. Not mimes. (laughs) Mime over murder would be a silent film. (laughs) And a very bad podcast. Yes, a podcast in which we describe people acting out murders with their hands, like up against the glass, just like leaving... Like, like they do anything... The murderer found it was a windy day. Do that thing where they climb a rope. <laughs> this is the problem with it being a podcast. You actually are very good at the uh, mime things. I really wish our li- wish our listeners could see it. Well, that's, a bunch yeah, of our listeners how... can. I'm just going to point out that for our <laughs> folks, and we'll talk about this later. But for our folks who are supporting us on Patreon, we've got a whole bunch of them watching us online today. They're they're peeking in through Zoom so they could see us pick our nose and yes, get the show. And on. they can watch Kevin do his mime uh, mm. hand on glass situation. We'll do that real quick. 
Ooh, the <gasps> alarms are going by. There's some sort of an emergency. Yeah, always. There's always just with you, Laura. Always. Is it a squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. The fire trucks are going by. I don't know. Oh, we can right. hear it now. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can hear it. It's Foley. Yeah. It's like Limetown. It's over Limetown there. Fire Department. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Old reference. Deep cut. Deep cut. People, by the way, who are uh, listening to this podcast have no idea what Limetown and, is. And the Wondery Ambulance is right behind them. <laughs> that shit came out so long ago. All right. Well, I'm really looking forward to talking about this week's topic. I think we should just get it going. What do you think, Kevin? Let's do it. Let's drop that first clip. Do you still have that murder board? I do. I mean, it's just a cork board on wheels, but yeah, I have it. Do you still have that boom mic? You bet your ass I do, kid. Well, I don't actually. I returned it in the 30-day window to get my deposit, but I can get it back. When we last saw them, Charles, Oliver, and Mabel were hauled off for the murder of Bunny, the Arconia building president. But their newfound infamy and the success of their true crime podcast has given the trio the opportunities they've dreamed of. Mabel is recognized for her artwork, Charles' classic TV show is revived, and Oliver may finally solve his money problems. Would you ever consider selling me the rights to the podcast so I could turn it into an 8 to 10 episode streaming? series with exclusive internet content leading to gamification? This is a thought you just had? And surely you've considered developing it into a series. Well, I'd be lying if I didn't say I had a 200-page pitch deck floating around my apartment somewhere. <laughs> but true crime rival Cinda Canning's new podcast focuses on them and whether they killed Bunny. The only way to clear their names is to create another podcast to prove to the world they didn't do it. We stop by, we suss out the crowd, I slip into Bunny's closet, down her secret elevator, into the alley. Where we can be with the painting. And then back up to Bunny's and out. Yes! Oh, that's a plan. I think this is really good. We're getting the hang of this. Absolutely. You can tell us our second season. <laughs> yes, Oliver. It is the second season of the Emmy-nominated only murders in the building. Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez return to send up true crime podcasts while providing a captivating whodunit. With a new batch of suspects and a mystery around the Arconia's past, the stakes for the team have never been higher. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Only Murders in the Building, so if you want to remain spoiler-free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes to hear our thumbs-up or thumbs-down reviews. Lara Bricker, do you think that was a nod to Crime Writers On when we talk about you can tell it is our second season? I do. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I know Steve Martin is following us on Twitter right now. No, not all of us. <laughs> well, Laura, Crime Writers On. He's not following me, but he's following Crime Writers On. Mm. Yeah. And not only is there that you can tell this is our second season, there is sort of a nod to like our own Crime Writers On journey where after we had our first successful season, everybody branches off into their own endeavors. So like... Toby became a UFO superstar. Rebecca went off to do all her things. Kevin went off to Law and Order. Laura was like, I need to do something. But in this one, <laughs> you know, uh, we have Oliver, who is getting the TV rights with Amy Schumer. We have Charles with the Brazo reboot as Uncle Brazo. We have Mabel with the art gallery plot line going on. But to me, that rang very true to like somebody starts a podcast and then they have a good season. And then it's like, here's all of these opportunities we have for like sponsorship and other things we're going to be doing. And now we're all together, but we're all going to be doing our own little endeavors. So I don't think it's us. <laughs> it's not us. No. Well, I mean, it is it is everybody but me. Um, I was the longest one to blossom. Um, basically. <laughs> well, but Toby, there are a lot. There is a lot going on this season, right? A lot, there's a lot of subplots, a lot going on with each of the characters. Like it's not the straightforward one to two to three to four narrative that we had in season one. Yeah, I actually had to write them down because there's so many so you've got Charles, who's got the, the Brazos reboot. He's got his father's history with sleeping with different women and getting his portrait painted naked and then reuniting with his daughter. You've got Mabel, who uh, you know has this thing going on with the Artist Collective and Carla Delevingne. And then you have Oliver, who's got the thing with Amy Schumer, uh, trying to get the rights. There's Teddy, who wants revenge for 
putting him in jail and then re-engaging with his son around his son's like directing Wizard of Oz, I guess. And then there's all these other things that are going on, like the plans for the building, Teddy's trouble with his son, Tina Fey shows up every once in a while. And then that's, we haven't even talked about the actual mystery itself that they're trying to solve. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And it seems like, you know, about two thirds of it probably has some kind of impact on the plot and the other stuff is just sort of character development. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff to tie up and that had me like, are they going to be able to do this? Is there just going to be a ton of loose ends? And, you know, if this was true detective, I'd say, yeah, there's going to be a zillion loose ends and then an unsatisfying ending. I think with Steve Martin writing, you know, I have confidence that he's going to be able to to do it, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Hmm. Suck up. <laughs> so, Kevin, you keep uh, like talking to me and something that I've noticed, too, about just sort of like the characters in this space, in this show. I mean, obviously, Steve Martin and Martin Short have been working together forever, right? Mm-hmm. You add Selena Gomez to the mix. She was new to the trio last season. and But this is, this is like a very new setting, a very new show, a very new place for all three of these people. But it feels like home in many ways, right? Well, there's a real ease to the characters, the way they sort of move through this this world and the way they interact with one another. It seems very natural. It comes off really well. Meantime, what I have picked up on is that there is a real sadness to each of these three characters. And it's it seems genuine and it seems like it's the kind of thing that we can pick up on, but it doesn't bring them down as characters. It doesn't make them sad sacks or turn us like, you know, oh, that's a, a sad person. We, I don't want that. We saw in season one what their wants were, what the things that they were dreaming about, and they're getting that in season two, but yet it still feels a little bit like that isn't the thing that's going to make them happy, even though that's what they want. But I think that the two sides of the production of this show is you've got Steve Martin and then you've got the guy, and I forget his name, but he's he was responsible for This Is Us, which is a funny yet super emotional drama. And I feel like they're bringing both of those things. Steve Martin and his team are responsible for some really funny dialogue. I don't understand things she says. Can you talk to her and just find out anything? Why? Because I'm a girl? No, because you're young. She used the word Manhattan, and you just used hot goss. It's like I'm watching Squid Games without subtitles. But also this part of the character development where they each have these kind of regrets and kind of things that they they want. You know, the sadness of putting Lucy in the car to send her off to Connecticut just kind of like hits me as, yeah, they've really developed fully fleshed out farcical characters, hmm. right? So that they're funny and they have, you know, they're believable in this silly way but they're also three-dimensional. So, Laura, one episode that really, like, is is the exemplar for that for me is the Bunny's Last Day episode. Yes. You know, we take this woman who in season one was a caricature, and at the beginning of this season, you know, obviously she's got, like, a knife in her body, spoiler alert, but everybody who's, like, listening to this point knows that, and she's dead, and she's the victim, and she's always been sort of the butt of the joke, right? And there is a whole episode which sort of follows her through this final day, and we see this very different side of her you know throughout the day we see her at the diner we see her with the waiter we see her like giving up her vaunted place as the head of the building and passing the torch and you still see her being a dick to people when she'll turn to them and talk but then you see this completely other side Mm -hmm. i loved this episode uh it was so different and so like format breaking what did you think about it Yeah, I think this was actually my favorite episode. I think, you know, through the first season, to me, Bunny was sort of like a caricature of this stereotypical condo board president in New York in this old established building. And so we see Bunny's day begin with she's doing her exercises on her little yoga mat with Mrs. Gambolini. And she's like talking to the bird because it's clear we hear how long this bird has lived this bird is her companion. And again, this shows you the beginning of Bunny having some sort of attachment to something because up until now, she wasn't really portrayed as somebody that had connections with other people or other beings or other, you know, animals and birds in this case. And then, you know, going out, going to the diner and 
looking at her little Boca Raton brochure. And I just thought Boca Raton was like the perfect place for Bunny to be moving to. That is like the quintessential old person Florida spot. I have driven to that spot. But then we see her leave this envelope of cash for Ivan the waiter. I went over 20%. Oh, Bunny, uh, that's too much this time. No one else who needs it. Come on, take it. Get yourself that DJ equipment you wanted. And then you see the care that she's putting into the transition of turning the board presidency over to the super pregnant lady as they're sitting out on the little bench outside and she's, you know, giving her the floral arrangements and the lady's like, I know, I know, I know. And Bunny's like, well, okay. And off she goes, by the way, I love her little wheelie cart that she has. Very Um, New York, by the way. They they all have them. It has a drink Yeah, All the old people have those. I need a wheelie cart. How else are you going to bring your groceries home from like Christie's if you don't have one of those carts? I was thinking my cats could go in it. (laughs) Yeah. I know we're going to talk about, right, the actual mystery, like who we think and everything later. But you just brought up the parrot, like who's been living there like a million years old. Do you think maybe the parrot saw something back in the 50s that probably ties into the murder? Do you yeah, think it's- I don't know. But my but my question for you, and this is what I was wondering, Kevin, didn't didn't you get all the signals that that Bunny knew she was going to die on that in that episode? Except for like, I, like that's I mean that's the, all the signals I got. She's like giving away money, like that's it. They're giving away her stuff, like handing over the banner. Like, I mean, those well, are the things that it's like all the quintessential like stuff that you do when think, you know you're going to expire. I, I think. I was going to say real quick, I think that giving up her seat as president of the head of the condo mm-hmm. board to her was like dying yep. because yep. that was her identity for so long. So that's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, I knew Kevin was going to say it with the pictures of her with the little kitty cat and her parents. It's like that's her, her identity. Yeah, yeah. It was very sad, though, when they went let her into the apartment and drink the champagne and you heard her crying outside the door. Oh, I broke my I damn heart. I would have let her in. I would have said, come in, buddy. You wouldn't, because she was a dick to them. Remember, she was a dick to them. Right, Toby? Yeah, that was what was good about that scene, is that uh, it's sad, but when she wants to have some kind of comfort or some kind of companionship, you know, it's denied her because of the way she's been over the course of years. You know, it's I guess it's kind of poignant, but it's also not surprising and and seem true. But did it not seem like that super pregnant lady is the one that did her in after that whole when Bunny's like, I'm too not early. Too early. I don't know. Yeah. Too, way too early. Yeah, we're, we're, we're leaning on the traditional structure of the open, of too the closed early for mystery. It to be Nina, man. Yeah, and if you get, right, I still feel like we're still getting pieces, but the big clue, like the one, the key that opens everything up that hasn't been presented yet. They'll put it in there, we're supposed to miss it, and it'll go by. But I think that we still are so early in that we probably haven't seen this, the real killer yet. I want people to understand this ordeal. It's taken a toll on both of us. Casey Anthony's parents respond after 15 years of allegations. I've gotten blamed for something I didn't do, and it tears me up inside. This can change our life. This is serious. This is their final response. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A and E, and watch next day on the A and E app. The friendship is sharing deal because I want one of your McNuggets, and I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite, like ten piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac, and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. All right, so Kevin, here we are in the business section. What do we have going on on our Patreon right now? Right now on Patreon, we have the Crime Writers on After Show. We're going to be talking about the cancellation of one of the greatest podcasts of all time, In the Dark. One of the greatest, the Uh, greatest. Fuck that shit. I know, we got a lot to say. Wow, coming out strong. Yeah, coming out strong. Well, preview that content. Fuck that shit, says Laura Bricker. (laughs) 
<laughs> we also have to talk a little bit about the gossip, the hot goss. Hottest goss. Around the new celebrity employee <laughs> at Rebecca's oh, grandmother's yeah. timeshare in the Cayman time- Islands. Laura's grandmother's timeshare. The, the place you guys went to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. And I've been as well. Yes, Laura. It was your Nana's timeshare that we borrowed. <laughs> well, no, but we traded in there. That wasn't actually her home. I know. Like, it's more, oh. it's yeah, more yeah, yeah, fun yeah. to call it your Nana's timeshare. It is just, because it sounds good. Exactly. Okay. It looked like it was furnished by the Golden Girls. So I totally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I'm aspiring to be one of the Golden Girls. And also that's where there's a picture of her with all the sharks. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that also on the after show. So anything else, Kevin? Yeah. Also in your Patreon feed, we have Outtake a Palooza Volume 2. Mm-hmm. So if you want to hear uh, 15 or 20 minutes of us screwing up. Yes. This is your jam. With a special cameo from a, f- a famous true crime podcaster. Not us? Yeah, which I was not expecting. Oh, no, the Jason Moon thing that yeah. you had? Uh, yeah. yeah, it was a special Jason Moon from Bear Brook cameo stuffed in the middle of that outtake of blues. It was very cool. Yeah, and if you were one of our patrons on Patreon, you could have been watching us record this particular episode. We're doing a, a Zoom cast here, and we've got a bunch of folks from all over the world. Dozens. Yeah, let's see. We Hundreds. Have, we have people from Finland. We have people from Minnesota and everywhere in between. Alberta. I don't know. Is Alberta? I don't think Alberta is actually in between. <laughs> Maybe if you go the other way. Yeah. I don't think Austin's in between those either. Yeah. Right? Well, okay. I don't know. I don't know about them there maps. <laughs> All right. So, Kevin, uh, do we have any Patreon patron saints of the week this week? Our Patreon patron saints are Jenny Moran. And Anna Piper, bless you. Yes, thank you, Jenny and Anna. Thank you for joining our Patreon, and thank you for everyone else who supports us there. And, of course, Kevin, I think uh, thus ends thus ends the business section. Yes, thus ends the business section. I'm going to fade that music out right now. So, Toby, you sent me a note questioning whether or not Mabel is getting the short shrift. What do you mean by that? Um, I, you know, and this is like totally subjective, obviously, but it just doesn't seem like she's getting quite as much of the plot line as the other ones are. I mean, really the only thing that she's doing that's outside of sort of the mystery is this weird thing going on with this art collective. And there's been a couple scenes of it, but there, there hasn't been a whole lot and it's not really clear what it means, if anything. And then even in the scenes you know, I mean, it's Steve Martin and Martin Short, so they're they're obviously sort of scenery chewers. But uh, I, I just kind of feel like she's like last among equals, right? I mean, it seems like she's receded a little bit. Again, we're like four episodes in, and what's it going to be like ten episodes? So I'm sure that that can change. But to date, it feels like she's been a little bit light. What Senda said wasn't wrong. My whole life has been defined by this crap, death walking around blood. I'd like to try and be an artist. And last night for a few minutes, that felt maybe possible. I really miss the podcast myself. I miss the heavy like podcast references. I hope that comes back. That's the one thing I think is getting the short trip this season. Is well, yeah. Many, many, many heavy references to podcasting and watching them make the podcast. Um, but Kevin, one thing that's not missing from the show the building itself being a character, they're actually putting the Arconia itself more in the forefront. What right. do you think about yeah. that? Yeah, well, I think that that's, you know, setting is an important part of any mystery, and they, they've they got a, a lot of great character in the building itself, uh, the Arconia. Just to jump back to your thing about the podcasting, I, you know, I'm, it certainly was built on its love of podcasts and true crime and those kinds of quirks. And you're right, it's not as heavy yet. I feel like that uh, the podcast itself within the show is like it's only MacGuffins in the building. It's just the idea this season to sort of get thrown into and propel the mystery gives them their reason for wanting to explore the mystery itself. But as far as the building, the setting, it's great. I Also, another thing to point out, I don't know if you guys notice this, visually... That um, the color palette is an interesting yellow, brownish earth tone, really kind of matches the mid-century modern interior of the building. The color palette also includes, you know, sort of that odd forest green and red that we see in the key art before the show. It's one of these, like, things, though, I bring it up because it's like, um, it's like that level of detail that you could tell the production crew, like, really is into this. 
And you look at those kinds of details, it, it belies a love of the material. Yeah, I mean, the wardrobing of Mabel in particular mm-hmm. is so specific. Like, this is something, I don't know, Kevin, I don't want to, like, stereotype you, but you don't typically notice wardrobing of characters as much as I do. But there's a, a couple of scenes in season one where you see Mabel, like, knitting, right? And, like, she's always, always wearing something that looks like she made. Like, she's always wearing, an, uh, like, a hand-knit, sweater for instance she's always wearing a like chunky uh plaid um she's always first of all it always looks like she's wearing something from her grandmother's closet like always so it's like something she made paired with something from her grandmother's closet and that is consistent throughout every scene in the series it's never like there's never a moment where it's like oh mabel's wearing something from h&m now no it is meticulous like the details are meticulous the details of steve martin's apartment are meticulous like you know every Every single apartment has a completely different vibe, and that is meticulous. It's like a dollhouse, the way that they do the set design, the way they do the costuming. And I just, I feel like the art direction in this show is like the people who got hired for it are having the time of their lives doing it. Mm -hmm. And that brings so much joy to the viewer in a way that art direction on a show, like it's like watching a Wes Anderson movie, but better. Like like less deliberate, less less ham fisted, yeah. more cozy. Yeah, we have a really great listener who uh, works on different movie sets and television sets. Uh, this was our, our secret friend who was able to get some of our books on the shelves in the background of a couple of TV shows, and he would say about like the vibe on set, like if it's a, a show, you know, that you think. I mean, you you're doing the work, right? You're not there as a creative necessarily. If the show itself is good and it's got good energy, you feel good about what you're doing there. If not, you're just doing your job. And it feels like from top to bottom, they know there's something special about what they're doing. Yeah, it kind of comes through, I think, to the viewer. Yeah. So, Toby, let's just talk a little bit about the characters themselves, because you sent me another interesting note about like their lack of New Yorkness. What do you mean by that? Well, I just, you know, if you think about what actors are quintessentially New York... Like Steve Martin and Martin Short don't necessarily spring immediately to mind, but I I don't know if a result of this is that they're going to seem that way because they certainly, I mean, they seem right at home, right? I mean, it's not, you don't watch it and you're like, huh, why are these people, why do they pick these guys to play these parts? Like they're perfect for the parts. And I think they play like a certain type of New Yorker maybe. So that that was my only thought is is that that it is like, you know, Martin Short, you think of, I guess, with Chicago because of Saturday Night Live. And I don't even, Steve Martin, he's all of America's. Yeah. Yes. He's all, he's all of ours. He he's the male Dolly Parton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you like seeing him in his wig and his uh, Brazos reboot? That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Same the, way, except the, it's white, yeah. And the, al- the album cover for his uh, his hit single is hilarious. <laughs> which was basically, he's got that hair. <laughs> yes, which was basically like a, a callback to his real life, like weird album making career where some of them was comedy and some of it was what, banjoing? <laughs> well, he had that one, the Steve Martin brothers, where one side was comedy and the other side was banjo music because he's yes. actually like a extremely accomplished banjo player. Yes. But that side, he's got like this total like you know, turquoise bell, like big, like peace chain or something. I is it's, it's very funny. It's your Halloween costume for next year. It is. Oh, Toby Ball. <laughs> my hair, Steve my hair Martin. is slowly turning till some, I'll be able to really do it. <laughs> uh, Laura, one thing I kept thinking about you when I was watching the show is the joy and delight you would have if you say discovered a secret passageway in the middle of the building where you are sitting right now. Oh, Jesus. You would spend 100% of your time peeking through those grades, listening to people in, in every room in the place, right? Oh my God, I've already done this. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I haven't. But This is absolutely like if any of you have listened to the interview I did with Janet Varney on her podcast about how I became Snoopy in her words, it was because I used to walk around horse auctions eavesdropping on people. So when I saw them going through the secret tunnel eavesdropping on people, I was like, oh my God, this is like my dream. And then the secret elevator, my other dream, I'm like, I need to clearly move to New York City and go to this building. Hmm. Kevin looks like you agree. I mean, this is yeah. this is made for Laura Bricker. Yeah, you right know, here. you know that part of the building is fake, right? <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. I I mean, I'm like I'm in my old office building tonight, which goes back to like 1873 or something. I bet there's a secret room in this building. Maybe there's a perv wall that you could get through and it gave me watching, horrible yeah. flashbacks to that. Whatever that show was with the, the voyeur. voyeur, yes. Yeah. 
in the they, in the motel. They mm. got the motel, and he'd like built like a little catwalk above the room so he could spy on people. And yeah. he said he was like keeping like a a, a sex uh, journal to like study the sexual habits of people hanging out at his yes, hotel. Yes, was yes. that? That was the one where the guy wrote the article for. Was it the New Yorker? No, it's Vanity it? F- Vanity Fair. Gay Toulouse. And yeah. um, and then they also had. Didn't they have like a little model of the hotel? Yes, I feel like. a little doll. And I, they did. Yes, yes, which I was kind of enamored with. Okay. Yes, uh, Toby. One scene that I loved. And I was wondering if what you thought about it was when <laughs> they thought that um, Mabel would be able to talk to Lucy because yeah. she was a young and they were old. <laughs> yes. And then, of course, Accurate. Was- <laughs> <laughs> when you're when you're 16, 25 is old. Anyway, you are so lucky. It's probably like so easy for you to get like, Zannies and Klonopin and stuff. I prayed to the 100 Gex Street to get a real diagnosis, but my mom, she like hates big pharma, so... <laughs> Guys, is the adult business concluded, please? I'll give you $200. So, Kevin, a uh, couple of things that you wanted to highlight. The scenes between Teddy and Theo. Uh, they were villains last season, and it looks like we're trying to like get, they're trying to get us back in our good graces again. Well, they're still, uh, we'll call them antagonists, but, <laughs> but, you know, I was really surprised, and I guess it's episode four where we see uh, them come back, how emotional their scene was together. We talk about like the sadness of the characters. Well, there really seems to be, there seems to be like a real great sadness here with Nathan Lane's performance and that of his son. When they're fighting, like, even though we don't get the translation of Theo's sign language, we still get the pain. We still are able to sort of pick up from the context that they are fighting with each other essentially over their love of each other, right? And, it, you know, it's again surprisingly moving. It has. All these great comedic notes, and then all of a sudden it turns to something that is not sanguine, but it just is sort of um, like a very human, very touching kind of passage. Hmm. Do you, like Toby, have confidence that the many loose ends of uh, the show are going to be wrapped up in some way? Oh, yeah. Or intentionally left hanging. Like there were a couple of loose ends from the last season. Like what? Like who poisoned Winnie the dog? Hmm. And who Sting. said. Sting. We know it's not Sting. (laughs) And who sent the text message to Charles and Oliver uh, when they're on the roof to get out of the building? Because it wasn't Mabel, and we know it wasn't the cop, because she denied it. I'm thinking Lucy, now that we know that Lucy was there in the building at the time of the the murder, but they left those, hey, you know, it's my, I suppose, and because they brought it up, they're going to address those in season two, I'm sure, because they haven't picked up for season three, they're going to leave a couple of things undone so that they can pick them up in season three as well. But I, th- I feel like whether they answer it all or even if they forget some, I don't feel like they're going to, it's too much care. They're not going to forget any of them. But it seems like they will wrap them up over the course of the season. This is a comedy first, but the mystery, we still want to follow that mystery and we're interested in that. That holds our attention as much as anything else. And so there are a lot of prestige dramas that go on for several weeks and they don't have the fuel in their mystery to keep our attention till, you know, the big finale. And we saw this with season two with a couple of season one with the side thing with the the funeral homes and, you know, the, the jewels, the, the jewels and the thing the person, the, the girl falling from the roof and, all you know, all this stuff was in there and they were able to spread it out. And I feel like Toby listed off a whole bunch of things going on. You're right. There was a lot in season one. There, there is. And they the guys with the gardening podcast and the car. The gardening. There was a lot. We forgot about the guys with the gardening <laughs> podcast. We haven't even talked about the porn picture painting with the balls yeah. and the parrot that swears. And I mean, there's so much in this season. So many balls. So many balls. And not just Toby. Other balls as well. Oh, man. Painted balls. Colorful balls. <laughs> parrot balls. I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Oh, man. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. 
Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. All right, Kevin, so let's do what we do. But before we get to our reviews, is there something that you want to just mention real quick? Yeah, we've been doing a live broadcast with our friends from Patreon, and there was a poll that we put up, and we asked them two things. We asked them, who's your favorite character? And 51% said it's Mabel. Mm. 34% said Charles, and 15% said Oliver. And then we asked thumbs up or thumbs down on Only Murders in the Building Season 2. 5% said thumbs sideways. Wow. 95% gave it a thumbs up. 0%. Thumbs Zero down. thumbs down, yes. Laura Bricker, thumbs up or thumbs down for this series' second go. What do you think? I, I, you know what? I love this show. I feel like the second season, you know, there was some things I didn't love. Like, I feel like all of the, there was definitely a lot of star power that wanted to sort of glom on to season one. So we saw a lot of cameos by people. I love Shirley MacLaine. I would like to make her a Coco Tini. I didn't love <laughs> Amy Schumer um, in this. But overall, this is just something that's so fun to watch. It's just so entertaining. Like Steve Martin, Martin Short, Selena Gomez, the master of the deadpan humor. At one point, she says, you must ask permission to tell stories from now on. I'm like, oh, my God, this is my friend Jen talking to me all the time when we're out. And she's like, Bricker, you need to stop telling stories. But then there was one part when Martin Short's character is upset about, you know, the fact that he was cropped out of the photo and he was he was so upset about that. And he said, I'd rather be dead than boring. I'm like, you know what? That's my motto for life from now on. Um, so thumbs up for this. You know, obviously the first season was sort of something that caught us off guard because it was new. And it is it is hard to like, how do you keep something going in the second season? But overall, I love that this season for me anyway, I feel like the characters have become a lot more like three dimensional especially the character of Bunny. Um, we've got a lot of backstory. We learned about Charles's father, um, working both sides of the street. There, there's a lot more going on in terms of, you know, adding to the depths of some of these characters while also keeping the mystery going. So, and if anyone wants to come put some secret um, passageways in my office, I will totally accept that offer. So thumbs up. Toy Ball, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for season two so far of Only Murders in the Building? Yeah, I'm a thumbs up. You know, the first episode starts off with a cameo from Michael Rappaport. As the detective. As yeah. a detective who's doing this, like, great sort of profane detective trying to intimidate people's stuff. And it's it's really funny, I thought. And it kind of carries the whole episode because the rest of the episode I thought was pretty weak as far as the show goes. It's a lot of, like, getting things in motion for the rest of the season. So I had a sort of sinking feeling after the first episode, and I don't know if I hadn't seen the first season and it didn't have people who I liked in it, I might not have kept going, but it's, it picks up again in episode two. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, you know, it, it's, it's really well written. You know, Kevin brought up the sort of sadness in each character. I mean, I think it, it walks a, a very good line between having these characters have, you know, regrets and feel like they're like lived in characters, right? And and they're not characters who've succeeded to the degree that they wanted to succeed in these different ways. But it's not in a way that's kind of a downer. It's sort of more of a way that kind of like informs their actions and motivates what they do. And some of the stuff is is really funny. And I think there's for this kind of show, there's a lot of insight into people. Uh, so I think it's really well written. The acting is obviously great. Uh, other people have already talked about the look and feel of it. So it's just, you know, it, it's just really sort of top notch, I think. So strong thumbs up. Uh, I'm glad they did a second season. Hopefully they'll do a third. Kevin Flynn. Yes, Toby. Good news. They have been uh, renewed for a third season. Just while we've been talking? Just now. Oh, I just got awesome. the text Real alert. Real time. 
Found it on IMDb, season three. Yeah, look, uh, I think it was six Emmy nominations last week for Only Murders in the Building, Steve Martin. The Oscars for TV. The Oscars for TV, <laughs> as Ronald Young Jr. would call them. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, Selena Gomez snub. Absolutes. That's, that's horrible because she was great in season one. I think she's great in this. I love this. It's a thumbs up. It is an easy watch. Even if it doesn't, you know, get as much into true crime and as much into podcasting in season two as it did in season one. We kind of thought of it as a podcasting sitcom. It's a murder mystery, and however they get there, it's a fun Scooby-Doo kind of ride. These are three fantastic actors who have put together three different and really interesting characters, and uh, I pretty much would watch all of them. I've just got to say, Steve Martin... Why can't we be extras for season three? Yeah. Can we just be in the background? Yeah, we'll what are the pay, stakes? We'll pay our way. What are the stakes? What are the stakes, Steve <laughs> Martin? I'm not even going to ask you to follow me on Twitter anymore. <laughs> we have not a place even, to stay in New York. Well, we just we'll walk by in the back with a coffee mug. We'll yeah. be extras on Brazos, Uncle Brazos on, yeah. on that show. We'll carry these, one of those little These nuts Greek- are making me thirsty. Yes. Yes, we could do that. We can just stand in the back. We could be some fans standing outside the Arconia. Yeah. We could be some people sitting at the Pickle Diner. A Hitchcockian cameo, I think, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and anyway, it's it's a great show, and I hope it goes on forever. Thumbs up. Yeah, so I'm giving it a thumbs up, too. I actually agree with Toby. Episode one concerned me a little. I was very worried that they were going to continue the thread of our three protagonists being legit suspects in this murder and that we were going to have to watch a season that sort of followed that storyline and them trying to legitimately like exonerate themselves and that we were going to have to like sort of suffer through that and the fact that they dispatched with that so quickly and that episode two like really picked up I was like yes that was finally we're kind of back to the show that I wanted to watch I feel so much joy when I watch this show that even its imperfections feel not important to me um I just love it so much it really feels like being at home in a weird way that's very very difficult to describe I actually it's so funny because I I've seen feedback sort of about the Amy Schumer character being like too much or whatever but I think that's like extremely deliberate and you know she's even coming in in this very brash way and sort of like spoiling the moment Sting was too much but like that's what that's what she's doing. Like she's she's the interrupter, like reminding us like someone could wreck this for you. Right. <laughs> and like so when she's in the elevator doing that, I'm like, no, like she is pointing out how easy this would be to wreck. And like I'm like, I liked it that there that was there because it reminded me of like how precious this is. And I don't want it to be wrecked. And um, I actually thought that was kind of brilliant that they had her in there playing that that little spoiler. Um, So, yeah, I just I think the show is just brilliant on a whole bunch of levels. And I don't want it to go on forever because I think that it's the kind of show that shouldn't go on forever. It should go on as long as it should go on. Because it is a jewel. It is a perfect jewel in a box. And I get so much joy out of watching it. I could watch it again and again and again. And I'm really glad there's going to be a season three. And I just want Mabel's yellow coats to line my closet. That's all I want. So huge thumbs up for me for Only Murders in the Building, season two so far. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime Crime of of the week. The week. While many people are taking their jobs home, this family has been making their home at the job. Officials in Carson City say the manager, the janitor, and their two kids have been living inside the Children's Museum of Northern Nevada. Authorities were first suspicious when spotting their two-year-old walking around the museum. A search turned up food and sleeping bags in an off-limits area. They also found an assault rifle, four handguns, a knife, and a taser all within reach of any young children. The pair were fired. The janitor has been arrested for child neglect and firearms charges. It's unclear if his wife, the manager, will face charges too. Meantime, the museum remains closed until its board of directors can hire new staff and take steps to ensure the public's safety. So panel, it's not cool to move your family into a closet at your workplace, but there are worse places to do it than a child's museum. So at what tourist attraction might you want to move in? Laura Bricker, what do you think? I mean, y'all know where I'm going. 
I am going to the Big Cat Rescue with Carol Baskin. Mm. Oh, okay. And I'm moving in. And Carol and I are going to ride 10 miles on our bike together. And I'm going to hang out with the big cats. And me and Carol are going to just hang out and do cat things. Sounds pretty much on brand, Laura Bricker. What about mm-hmm. you, Toby Ball? What tourist attraction do you want to live in? Well, for, I actually, when I was working in D.C. at this magazine, there was a guy who did live in our office. Really? Ooh. Yeah. Like he he had his stuff under his desk and he'd sleep on a couch and yeah, he got found out and told to straighten up and ship or ship out or something. Mm. Anyway, uh, what, what tourist attraction? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe like the Vince Lombardi stop on the Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what about you, Kevin? I think I want to live in that Rise of the Resistance ride. <laughs> yes, at, you do. At Disney World. <laughs> you do. You absolutely do. And I think they also have like some weird hotel where it's like $10 million a night and it's like- No windows. You're on a, yeah. You're, well, you're in space and you know outside <laughs> there's stars and that's weird. Yeah. So I actually, it's, except for the weapons part. So I remember the children's book from the mix, Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. Yeah. That was a children's book where uh, brother and sister did live in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and they- ate food out of the automat and they lived off of money that they found in the bottoms of the fountains like this is a book that i loved when i was a kid so the idea of living in a museum is actually super duper freaking cool to me but the place that i would really want to live is a place that like i don't even know if it exists anymore it's that like weird cafeteria from north by northwest inside the uh, mount rushmore remember that you yes. probably don't remember that. Yeah, it's really freaking cool. Did it ever exist? I don't know, but it's in the movie. I've never actually been to Mount Rushmore, <laughs> but I love it. I love that set in that movie. So I thought it'd be a cool place to live. Plus, there's, you know, food and uh, Mount Rushmore. That's anyway, all you need. It's all you need. All right. You can live in the nose. <laughs> that's going to do it for us this week. But before we go, Laura Bricker, I have to ask. Do we have a cat of the week this week? <laughs> this might be the most unique cat of the week ever. Really? And thank God we have 153 viewers here to witness this occasion. Okay. The cat of the week this week is Stacey Margaret Jones's 96-year-old mother (laughs) who is staying with Stacey, one of our favorite Patreons. Just go with it. Okay. Um, Stacey, a member of the Brichter Scale, 96-year-old mother staying with us for five weeks for her annual visit. Stacey sent a picture of her 96-year-old mother on the treadmill, and she has been on there twice every day since she's missing her water aerobics at home. <laughs> uh, Stacy has not taught her about rage walking, but she will soon. After walking on the treadmill twice a day, Stacy's mom played the piano for a bit, and then she worked on a writing project. So, uh, yeah, there she is. Look at her. Stacy's mom has got it going on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she is, um, I know from Stacy's posts in the Brichter scale, like Stacy's mom will come in on Zoom and they sing songs together during the holidays. I mean, I want to basically be like her when she's 96. So um, I'm giving a big shout out to Stacy's mom. I thought you were going to say that Stacy's mom was pooping in a sandbox. I am so glad it wasn't. <laughs> no, that. no. Look at her. She's just like walking on the treadmill, like no big deal. Right. She's like, whatever. She, she does her. like a leather collar. Uh, Bricker, you need to get on the freaking treadmill. Like, Bricker, you're not walking fast enough. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Laura Bricker, if folks want to send their suggestions for actual animals to be our pet of the week for next week's show, and they want to, you know, send us an email, of course, at crimewriterson at gmail.com or submit them for Facebook, of course, they can do that. But if they want to reach you directly and maybe send you a tweet, how can they find you on Twitter? If Toby Ball's mom wants to be the next cat of the week, <laughs> she can tweet me at Laura Bricker on Twitter. And Toby Ball, if our friend Steve Martin wants to say hi to you on Twitter, how can he find you there? Uh, he can find me at Toby Ball and H. And Kevin Flynn, if he'd like to follow you someday, how can he find you? Fuck you, Steve Martin. <laughs> uh oh. Now I'd love for Steve Martin to follow me at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On. And please join our incredible community and our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. Just go to Facebook, search for us, find our page, and then hit join the group. Support the show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You get the Crime Writers on After Show, Married with Podcast, all the stuff we have behind our firewall. And yes, you will sometimes get to watch our show 
show live on Zoom, just like the folks are doing right now. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the very handsome Livy Burdett. The executive producer of this program is the very handsome Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, The Closet, in our New Hampshire basement, where we negotiate distribution and IP rights with Amy Schumer. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. What do we have going on on our Patreon right now, Kevin? Well, you can listen to the Crime Writers on After Show. Yep. Fuck you, Toby Ball. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> what did he do? What did he do? I He's it. laughing at me for making <laughs> like. All right. So oh, should, smell should I just say it? Here this is the most off the, off the rails thing. Thing. I know. It's should we mute them? The... All right. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. All right. All right. So, Kevin, here, by the way, guys, people watching, this is actually what happens all the fucking time. All the fucking it's not because yeah. you're here, I swear. Yeah. All right. So, here we are in the business section. Kevin, what do we have going on for business right now? Nothing. <laughs> Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.